What's up, everyone? It's Invisible Walls episode 117 here on GameTrailers.com. We're all about to head out to Comic-Con to cover it for you guys. We were actually recording this show a day earlier than usual. Definitely want to make sure we had a show for you guys. It's also a very special episode this week on Invisible Walls. This week, we're going overboard and answering all of your questions you ever asked about Game Trailers. Oh, okay. I was, I, was, I was surprised. Usually when it's a special episode, someone gets touched by an uncle or something like that. <laughs> No, there's actually this whole, well, I wouldn't say the whole episode, but a good part of the episode is going to be dominated by On the Hook. We asked you for, or Off the Hook, we asked you guys for questions last week. You delivered with some really good ones, so we figured we'd oblige and uh, answer as many as we can on the show. Here to do that, as you've already heard, is Ryan Stevens. Who is an uncle, but has never been touched by one. Are you sure? I hope not. Maybe I blocked it out. That's yeah, inappropriate it's... shit right there. This, is, this, <laughs> this podcast is rated AO. That's Invisible Walls. Hey, Miguel hello. Lopez. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Bloodworth on the show today. Hey, what's up? And Brooks Huber. That's right. How you guys doing? I put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable right there, but that's okay. Zeus! Your son has returned. All right, it's been a long time coming. We were not receiving the MPD reports for the last couple months, and when we would receive them, they would come in late, so we didn't really feel like it was uh, proper to put them on the show. We got the MPD report this time on time so we are going to talk about the sales of the biggest video games in the land and i guess uh, red dead redemption takes the top slot for software sales on the 360 almost 600,000 units across the month i think that game is definitely showing some legs especially when you look at the ps3 version in third place at 380k yeah, so that's that almost two million now right yeah that's it's almost a million month. units in you know, well, well after a month after it was released, that's that's some serious that's legs amazing, right there. But why did people have to get laid off? Yeah, well, I think the better so, question is, it's it's funny, you know, how many glitch videos have we seen on oh, the yeah. internet yeah. from this game? More than any game I can remember in recent memory. And I wonder if the glitch videos are drawing people to the game ultimately because they're like, <laughs> oh my god, marketing right there. Well, it they're they're cool glitches actually. Yeah. They're not just like, oh, the game breaks. It's like, oh my god, there goes some woman acting like a chicken. Like they're actually. You almost want them to be real so you can right. find them for yourself and not just be glitches. <laughs> but hey, it, it seems out. that they're also rare enough where when you do see one, it's kind of like a little Easter egg for you. Well, yeah. it depends on who you talk to. You talk to Jeremy Hoffman, he says those things popped up like every five minutes. Other people I talked to right. said they played all the way through the game and never saw it. That's also like your friend who who claims to have seen like five UFOs in as many years, you know. <laughs> Like, yeah, on, that's man. true. I think wow. we can trust Hoffman. He's, he's he's a pretty straight shooter. So, but it just you're right. It does seem like it's all over the place. Some people say they had lots of problems with it. Other people say that they didn't, they didn't have any problems with it. One thing I will say is Rockstar is not having any problems with the sales of this game. I mean, it, it's doing extremely well. Second place, Super Mario Galaxy Two. Huzzah! Yeah, I'm glad <laughs> it's broke a million now. Yeah, so. it took the first one a little longer, right? think so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the first one I think that Nintendo would probably even agree didn't quite sell up to expectations. It didn't sell as well as I thought it would, at least, especially considering the quality of the game. Yeah. It's kind of odd that uh, New Super Mario Bros. Wii sold so much better. Yeah, and it's still on the chart there. <laughs> yeah, there it is at number four. And actually, it didn't sell that many less than Super Mario Galaxy 2. You're talking about legs. Yeah, talking about legs. Those are some serious legs. And then there's Just Dance. Also legs. Yeah, <laughs> that you dance on. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, truly word of mouth is on the internet. I mean, you know, marketing on Twitter, Facebook. Yeah, I still have to wonder, like, why did this one take off and, like, Boogie didn't? Or the other, like, hundred. Well, maybe there's not a hundred, but there's a couple there's a other lot. ones. Like, uh, why did this one take off? I don't know off? what it is. Maybe it's the music selection. Yeah. The cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, the only new ones are Toy Story and Harry Potter. Yeah, and Toy Story 3 is not the console version. It's the <laughs> Nintendo DS version. Yeah, it's something... Was there a coupon given out at the movie or what? I don't know, but they did not give us numbers for anything outside the top five. It's amazing how MPD keeps sort of choking the numbers more and more to give us less and less to work with here. Um, I guess they want us to pay for them. Um, you would think just us doing a segment about MPD would be <laughs> enough free promotion, but... So we don't have the numbers for the top five, although I think it's safe to say that UFC 2010 Undisputed is not doing as well as the first game. Maybe a lot of people felt like once they got the first game, that was good enough. And Yeah, I, I heard some talk about, you know, the importance of, uh, you know, roster changes and how with UFC it just doesn't make as much of a difference year on year. Yeah, I mean, they don't change all that much. I mean, Kimbo is out of the UFC now. That's kind of a big deal, but... 
Yeah, but I think you know they'll probably fix it in 2011 by letting you kill someone, <laughs> and then the rosters will really change. I mean, Let it's me, bound to happen, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the in other problem life. with the UFC is it's not like a wrestling game where you need very specific tools to create a character. It's like you have a general character creation tool that gives you, you know, 100 or 200 hairstyles. You can pretty much create most of the guys in the UFC with that. So, I think it's a good thing though, like that. Rather than in relying on arbitrary uh, roster changes, this allows the game to succeed on the merit of what it brings new every year. It's true. Yeah. But it looks like the people voted with their money, and they're like, screw that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's the problem with core sports games, and UFC is probably on the periphery of that. But, you know, it's, it's when you have a baseball game, it's a baseball game. You can add stuff every year, but you're still – unless you, like, really – build it from the ground up it's kind of right. the same game so I mean, all things considered thq spent a year building this game and there you see the 360 version at 8 and the ps3 version at 10 i think another thing we're seeing here is seeing the 360 and ps3 versions a lot more closely ranked in the top 10 than we have for for a lot of games in the past so it looks like that gap is continuing to close between those two platforms as far as third party sales mm -hmm. but and then hair lego harry potter ninth place Everybody here seems to love the game. I haven't played it. Have any of you guys played it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, Me and Brooks played it. Nice place on the Wii <laughs> as well. So Yeah. It's cool. It's it's kind of what you expect. A lot of people around the office seem to love it. They say it's the best Lego whatever game so oh, far. Right. And You're talking about Jeremy Hoffman again? <laughs> well, he's one of them. But no, there's been a lot of people here playing that game. Uh, it, it certainly did update the formula. You know, and uh, the setting, you're basically in Hogwarts and the surrounding areas. Like That lends itself well to... You know, it being a place that you can explore and not just a series of levels. So, yeah, it was it was well done in that sense. So here's the stuff all the kids want to really hear, and that's the console sales. <laughs> I'm surprised by 360. Yeah, it won another month. I would have thought it was way higher, though. I would have well, thought. Well, the I mean, is still on top, but, yeah, over the Wii. No, I mean, I would have thought it would have sold more. When people because were saying it was the, new the slim, unit. people were saying it was selling out. Because do you remember when the, um, when the DSi came out? It, like... The DS sales like doubled that month, and yeah, it had some more functionality and stuff. But it's kind of interesting. Well, I mean, that's kind of double for the 360, right? I mean, it's usually around 300k or something like that. And it's now not it's an actual it. double, though. No, I, mean, it's I, not. I was expecting it. I was expecting it to beat the DS. Well, the other part too is or how many machines do they actually have ready? I mean, that was their first shipment, so yeah, it's going to be interesting to follow it into. Um, this month, J July. I, I'm just saying I was surprised it wasn't a little bit higher. Yeah, I mean, the PS3 is right behind there at 304K, so it's not like it got its ass kicked, even though Microsoft rolled out a brand new machine. So I'm wondering if people, I wonder if it is the fact that they couldn't produce enough or if people just don't feel like the new 360 is a worthy proposition. Yeah, well, it was sold out where I went. Yeah. I wasn't going to pick one up. I just was curious to ask, and it was at Best Buy, and he said, oh, those sold out right away. Hmm. So maybe it was a stalking issue. Yeah, Could have mm. been. Well, you got to figure when they launch machines, they usually have around a million units or something like that to launch with. So, and that's with like the very first launch of of a system. So, I don't know if we should project gloom and doom yet on the 360 Slim. I think that's still a pretty respectable number. Microsoft did win another month. That's the second time in I don't know how many <laughs> in a lot of months, but they did take another month, which is uh, something to uh, to think about. The Wii still at 422k, not far behind the 360. And I wonder if the Black Wii has uh, helped boost sales at all. Its bundle packages are looking pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you get the Black Wii. You get the Wii Sports and Wii Sports Resort, and you get a Motion Plus for 200 bucks. So. Yep, and it's black. You get a black controller. It's so. a pretty good deal. Um, so I'm wondering if that may have given it a little bit of a boost. And then the DS. I don't even know why you talk about the DS anymore. It's just a runaway train at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to you wanna guess first month of uh, 3DS sales? As many as they can make. Yeah. Period. Whatever they say they're launching with, that's how many they'll sell. That's bottom. I even if they, Did they ever actually announce how many they're shipping though? No. For hardware numbers, they, even they said never when they're when they're shipping yeah. it yet. But yeah. I guarantee whatever number like Nintendo 11. announces that they're gonna have, I don't care if it's two million at launch. I don't care if it's three million at launch. I think they'll sell them all. I mean, that machine makes that big of an impression. I think again the. The challenge for Nintendo is getting it in people's hands, but they have experience with that with the Wii. You know, they kind of had to do that with the Wii as well, make sure people played it, um, and they were really good at that and successful at that. So I don't see why they wouldn't be able to do that with the 3DS as well. Any other uh, notes you guys have picked up on from the MPD this month? No, other than things just being low in general. I mean, Japan was pretty low last week too. I think Wii Party came out at like a quarter million on yeah. top, and everything below that was like 
tiny, 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 like 80,000. Yeah, about the only thing that's up is hardware, thanks to the 360 Slim, I'm sure, <coughs> and video game accessories, but both games and software. And I bet you July will be even more depressing because Crackdown's a kind of big game, but StarCraft's the big game this month, and that's PC. That's not going to be factored in. It won't even show up on here. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be factored in at all. Well, actually, do they factor in PC sales into the overall video game number? No, I think video game's it? completely separate than PC. Are you sure? PC. Yeah. No, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure. So what, like, PC games get factored into, like, the Nothing. same productivity <laughs> what are they software? Into? I think they have their own PC line. Yeah, I mean, they, they used to do weekly for PC. I don't know if they still do. But they used to do weekly with numbers for PC. It was kind of interesting. Yeah, overall, the industry down 6% which is a little concerning looking at the uh, the immediate horizon with not a lot of big AAA games coming. So we've got to pick it up by the bootstraps. I wonder how much this stuff will change uh, if they were to more reliably track stuff that people buy online through the various networks. You mean through digital distribution? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, full games I don't think are still getting a whole lot of, of love in that area, but it would be interesting if they started rolling in some of the DLC games. I mean... We've heard some reports from from the Deadliest Warrior game, and I can't publicly announce what they are, but it did some pretty freaking awesome sales. I'll mm. say that much in a short period of time. All right, next we're going to talk about what I think is one of the coolest looking DLC games in recent memory. Um, I'm sure other people would disagree with that because of its uh, monochrome nature. It's also not three dimensions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Limbo. I'm sure you guys have probably seen footage of it at this point. So the whole game's kind of a silhouette, I guess, is the best way to describe it. Yes. Works Different for degrees shadows. of silhouette and yeah. shadows. Ryan, you played the game for review. Now, the first thing is there's sort of dissenting opinions on how long this game is. Now, you say it take it took you I, three hours, I right? went home, I downloaded the game, uh, I started it at 9, I finished it around a little after midnight. Um, I got really stuck on one area for a good, like, 20 minutes, just banged my head on the wall until I, I got through it. Got a little bit stuck at a couple other places. So I said, you know, the game's around three hours, maybe I should have padded that to four. But Why I, would you fudge the amount well, we, of time we, it took you to Round be... up, round up, you know, yeah. but... um. <laughs> Were you playing it in a wormhole and shit? <laughs> <laughs> it was a Tesseract, actually. Yeah. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I it was a, sat down, I think, you know, just played it all the way through. I think I maybe got up to pee once, but I don't think people need to know that. Yeah. And, now, some uh, people are saying it's like eight hours long. Yeah, and I guess if you get really stuck, you could really take more time. I really would, <laughs> That's I like don't know, I would, I would like... I would say, I mean, you played the game a little, Shane. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of you saw it at GDC, Miguel. Yeah. I mean, the game is very linear. You're always heading forward. Yeah. So even when you do get stuck, there's only so many objects that you can interact with. Once in a while, maybe you don't notice if there's something you can exactly interact with. And then the vocabulary of your controls is really small, too. You can oh, jump yeah. on like things. Two buttons. You can grab things. You can push, pull, and switch things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what about distractions in terms of like collectibles or just hidden things in the levels? Is, would that there, take up there any are, more time? There's, there's like seven or eight uh, achievements, all for hidden things. Yeah. Um, and they're very well hidden, and that's, that can take you a little bit of time to go find them. But again, it's not like the game branches out very much, more yeah. than a couple steps. I mean, you probably never get to an area that's would I'd call like bigger than maybe like four four screens, if that makes sense to the people mm -hmm. um, that you'd be like interacting with. Um, it's it's really really fun. I mean, I enjoyed every second for uh, that I was playing with it. But um, I mean, if you have to, you know, you can't ignore how much a game costs. And right. this game's fifteen dollars, and it just felt a little expensive. And it is tr it's amazing. It's beautiful. It uh, has really good puzzles, but it's also very very traditional. It wasn't something like Braid, where you like uh, where you know that game did take me multiple play sessions, and I had to like sleep on it for to get some of the puzzle pieces. But that's something that also like really I hadn't really experienced. I mean, you could maybe say sands of time a little bit but that's only the tip of the iceberg this is very much a um it's the presentation that's unique it's not the game design or the game well play. the gameplay is you know it's not unique but it's it's devious in a in a good way i mean i guess you could say that the constant d death as your teacher is maybe something but that's a really old school idea mm -hmm. that's just being brought back and death not being that punishing is nice but uh 
yeah, there's nothing really other than yeah, exactly. Other than the look, there's nothing out and out like unique about the game. It's a great experience. It's just a pity that it's so expensive. I mean, I personally would purchase it regardless. Um, but I'm crazy, so I don't know about like other people. <laughs> and apparently, really good at games. No, just just this one, I guess. I may uh, the game is made in Europe, and my mother's European, so maybe that had something <laughs> to do with it. I I'm just know. wondering what the huge disparity in time where it would come in. If you got stuck a lot, I guess that could start adding up to hours, but really seven or eight hours seems... For me, if really I get high. that stuck, like I've learned to walk away from the game because you just fall into this mental loop where you keep trying the same things over and over, assuming that the next time you try it, something different is going to happen. Unless you have to play the game, in which case you're just tearing your hair out. I, I, you know, I'm in that situation all the time, but I still find myself <laughs> at, least take, yeah, at least taking 10 minutes away from the game and coming back, and you'll be amazed how quickly, if you get your mind off of it, how differently you look at it when you come back to it. So that's what I do. I try not to smash my head against the wall trying to figure something out. I like to go to bed thinking about the problem, and then when I wake up, my pillow's missing. <laughs> I think I got two stories confused there. All right, here we go into our marathon session of On the Hook. Ryan is going to go over the first one. Uh, where do you guys stand on the video games and art debate? I have to say that if movies... Move, I think you meant movies. If movies yeah. can be called art, then why can't video games... It says video game. Um... And this is from uh, Spike. What's up, Spike? <coughs> well, I mean, just the game we were just talking about, Limbo, you know, it's, it's super artistic. I guess the bigger question is, what is art? You know, and that's a, a can of worms. But <laughs> or a wormhole. So I mean, uh, <laughs> yes, let's go over that theme. Uh, I mean, it comes back to the question, I mean, do you consider a great work of literature to be art? Do you consider a lowbrow art? To be art, I think you I mean, know it's kind of a stupid question, yeah, almost. I think the the best way to address this is like take one starting point and then you know go from there. Like uh, one interpretation of art is something that allows you to make sense of the world or view the world through a different lens. Do games do that? I sometimes, I guess. Well, role playing games. <laughs> <laughs> I think my definition of art is something that isn't necessary, but it makes it feel necessary. That's deep. Does that make any sense? <laughs> no, well, I mean, I, I, I think something that communicates and evokes, you know, an, an emotion. emotion. Yeah. And, I mean, and you see, I mean, you know, like with a lot of just, you know, abstract painting and stuff like that. I mean, it's really, you know, it's interpretive. It's about motion and color and, you know, and you you can't identify like what is that you know i mean everyone has a different interpretation a lot of times what what, what emotions do games make you feel like frustration all of them really <laughs> yeah. I, I, games make me feel probably more emotions than most paintings do in all honesty i mean especially a lot of the classic paintings that you know were just paintings of people um abstract art to me i think evokes more emotion than realistic art at least personally um, but i get the whole spectrum from games i wish i got more uh sadness maybe from games and that sort of emotional attachment it doesn't seem like games go that deep a lot of times but right. when they do it, it's awesome um, I've mentioned this before I don't know if I mentioned it on the show but one of my favorite moments ever from video games was in Ocarina of Time when Link comes back to the village and it's on fire and you, it just the look on his face and just you start thinking about what if I came back to my home and my home was on fire my family was in there and my loved ones were in there so that was one of those moments in games and you know that was with the N64 it really had nothing to do with technology it was all about setting up the love of his village with you, um, introducing you to the characters in that village so you cared about them, so that whenever something horrible happened to them and you came back, it really struck a chord. And that bothers me more than all these HD games that I've seen where you know their wife dies or they're going back for vengeance. It was just something about that moment in that game that just... It just struck me really hard at the time, and like I still feel it all these years later. Right. So. Yeah, the, you know, there's a... a the impact of interactivity is, is different. You know, you, you look at just stuff like simply going around and talking to NPCs in, in an adventure or an RPG. And like, really, if you wrote those things out in a book, it would not be that interesting. But because you've gone there and you feel like you've met this person, like you have more of an attachment to them. And same thing with your, your, your characters and your party and all of that. You've spent a lot of time with these people. Mm -hmm. And so you, you get that attachment there. And I also I think it's I think it's bizarre that there's even a debate that like okay here we have something where you have music and you have artwork and you have animation you have storytelling you put them all together and you get something that's not art. 
Well, I, I think one yeah. of the things you have like twenty <laughs> artists working on something. But I that's think that not art. I think that's the point with a, a lot of the people in the not art crowd is that um, there's a great essay by Walter uh, ben- Benamine uh, called uh, "The Age of Art in Mechanical Reproduction," where when photographs first came out, people were like. I can reproduce these. How can this be art? Because it's reproduced. And then it kind of went to something where you look at like Andy Warhol, where he had like, you know, the factory system where it was almost like art factories. And then you have artists today that are literally, there's artists that don't touch their artwork. They hire people to do everything. They're just conceptualized. And I think it's kind of funny to look at video games where you can't really point at like when, you know, you hear about an art film and, you, you know, you, they put like the praise onto the director or the auteur. There's, um, you know, there's some game designers that have their name out there, but usually it's kind of this kind of corporate thing that kind of gets put out. So it's kind of like this it's kind part of, of a corporate. Brand. It's kind of a corporate art, and that's where I also see the indie game stuffs kind of coming up again because you're seeing these like two people, one person, whatever, small teams kind of getting up there, and it's just kind of the separation of the the aura of the artist, which definitely can affect the artwork, versus you know just here's an, something that's aesthetically pleasing and interactive. Uh-huh. And if you go to any like museum, all the like interactive installations are pretty much video games. I mean, they're microcontrollers mm-hmm. and interactive video and moving parts, you know, that you interact with. Well, I think what spurred on this debate, right, is Roger Ebert saying the games aren't art. He got <laughs> he got slammed. I mean, he, I don't think he realized how passionate, you know, our users are and the people who play games are. And I think it caught him off guard. And he actually had to go back and, like, readdress everything because he people had sent him really poignant emails that kind of made him think, you know what, maybe I'm an idiot. And I think that's sort of what started this whole debate. I haven't really talked to a lot of people that are within our age range or have kind of grown up with this medium who would say video games aren't art. It's usually the 50, the 60, the 70 year old people who didn't grow up with games. A lot of those people have made a conscious decision to never even eat. Roger Ebert says he's never played a video game, which I think is a little irresponsible of him to make a statement like that, having never touched the medium. How do you know until you've tried it? What's different about movies that makes movies art that makes video games not art? I think a lot of it comes down to like a formal question. Um, the big one is, does the fact that the author, in this case being the people who make the game, the author basically relinquishes authority to, of their story to the players. You know, They could set up all of these scenarios, like the one you described in Zelda. They could set it up and, and basically hope that you're going to react to it a certain way. But once they put you in their world, it all goes out the window, you know? Mm-hmm. You could get to that sequence and start running around and, like, you know, throwing rocks at the villagers. and Breaking the game sort of thing. Essentially, yeah. So it's right. giving control. But, well, that's when you, but that's when you get into things that, you know, people say something's a readerly work or a writerly work, you know? Where, like, uh, you know, once the author is, subtr- I mean, this, this is like all very kind of heady stuff, but it's it, it, these are things people debate about all the time. But I think that even cements it more that like this is an art form, you know? There, it's it's beyond craft. Yeah, I, I think it's be, gone beyond the realm of craft. I, it's, it's like what Bloodworth said. To me, the most obvious answer is you have musicians and artists working in dozen in groups of dozens on this product. Yet what they're working on is an art, but they're artists. So how do uh, how do Scores of artists work together on something that ultimately does not become art. Well, scores of artists also work on, like, Geico commercials, you know? But I think even in the the advertising medium, I think there is some art in the advertising medium. I don't think all commercials have no sort of artistic value to them. I think there are some commercials that certainly do. So I think, you know, you can't say all paintings are art. I don't think you can say all movies are art. I don't think you can say all video games are art is is you know, Tetris art? Probably right. not. It's like all dogs are mammals, but not all mammals are dogs. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think the answer is certainly, yeah, they can be. And they can be, right. Yeah. And, and I think that's probably the best answer, just like there are some movies that I, I'm i sure a lot of people wouldn't consider art as well. So uh, it, it's an interesting question, but I think a lot of that will, will sort of fade over time as these older generations start to sadly die and, and sort of move on to whatever's next. And, uh, and the people who have grown up with this medium and embraced it and accepted it uh, sort of take over the common lexicon of what art is or what it isn't. What the heck's going on? Issa's code is inscribed within the child of Issa. You have chosen Imaginal's Law. Imaginal's Law? What nonsense is this? Question number two, Miguel Lopez. 
why don't game company charge the retailer who sells the used <laughs> Don't game? read it how they wrote it, dude. Read it right. <laughs> why don't game companies charge the retailer who sells the used games instead of the gamer who usually only ends up playing maybe $5, paying $5 less for a used version? So basically, why are the it's publishers from brownies? from brownies? So basically, the, the question is, why don't the game publishers screw the retailers as opposed to us? And I, I think the answer is... Uh, because this system is set up to make you miserable. <laughs> <That's why. laughs> well, I think, I mean, it comes down to enforcement, right? I mean, how yeah. do they make them pay for them? There's there, no way. They don't get them from the publisher. There'd have to be some, like, FTC heavy lobbying, right, to make some sort of rule for this sort of thing. Like, yeah. it's like when um, Blockbuster started renting Nintendo games. It, like, went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court was like, you're okay to rent Nintendo games, but you can't make photocopies of the manuals. Like who knows who how you're going to interpret the law, no. but I think you'd have to have some something someone actually implement something and get it through Congress for any sort of like something like that. I know David Jaffe wants um, what are those things? He wants royalties paid to people that yeah. buy used. Well, games. Well, they're already starting to do it but a little bit when you buy a happen. used game, and if you want to get online with some of the sports titles that EA is doing, you have to pay for that ten dollars. But that's code what they're saying. The, the, that's what they're the gamer has to pay for that, not the retailer. Oh, not the retailer. I was looking at the in store. Uh, saying things much less eloquently. The retailers have the publishers by the balls. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. If they they don't, they can't sort of strong arm the retailers. Like the retailers kind of set the prices and are like, "Look, we're not getting a big profit margin off your games." So they go to them and say, "Hey, well, let's charge an extra ten bucks so we're making more, and we're trying to sort of get some of that recoup, some of that used sale money." Then the retailers will just jack up the price. So yeah. the publishers are actually in a in a lose lose situation here. There's nothing they can do. That's why they're pushing so hard for digital distribution because yeah. Yeah. they want to cut that guy and it's out. Gonna, it's going to be digital distribution in the future, and then your web browser will send your cookie information, and that's how the price will be decided for how you pay for video games. Yeah, well, I mean, well, sadly, Project Ten Dollar was really the only recourse the publishers had. Well, what I think is interesting is that. Uh, Still, when they have those games put out on digital distribution, they don't drop the price at all. You'd think you'd want to incentivize people to go towards that product rather than go to a store. No, You're absolutely it's, right. It's, but it's still a balancing. You can't piss off the brick and mortar stores too much. If you start it, undercutting the brick a, and mortar stores, it's a calculus yeah. problem, you know? And it's tough. And that's you why know. we don't do business. <laughs> exactly. That's <laughs> why we're video game journalists. <laughs> But I think that's really the issue right now is that the uh, the retailers are holding all the cards in the poker game. And the publishers, it's a very delicate situation. I think they feel like this online $10 charge thing is the only way they can kind of work around the retailers without the retailers getting too pissed off. Although I'm sure they're not happy about it because the used sales you know, for their games is it's going to affect it ultimately. It's going to affect the value of the used games that they sell. Um, you know, Obviously, a game isn't of equal value now if you don't have the, the option to play online with it. So... It's a, it's a delicate situation. I don't really see anything changing in the foreseeable future until digital distribution becomes more of a, a reality and a possibility, honestly. Like, you know, it, I'd still rather drive a block and a half to Best Buy to buy a game than sit overnight and wait to download a, a full-length game, especially at the full price, you know, as you mentioned. You've got to provide some kind of incentive for people to download it. Otherwise, they're just going to swing by a store and buy it. So. Some kind of interference. Gordon, stay put. We'll get you out of Something is drawing him away. What's the meaning of this? Who are you? How did you get in here? Question number three, Daniel Bloodworth. Uh, remakes slash reimaginings of games such as Goldeneye and Castlevania are trying to capture the nostalgia of previous versions. Uh, which, in my opinion, they never reach. I believe it's impossible, but I want your opinion. And that's from O. Steven. Um, Steven. O. Oh, Steven. <laughs> I hear oh. that all the time. <laughs> oh, Steven. Is that your brother? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Goldeneye to me, uh, and it's, almost, it's like the second time somebody's done it. EA kind of did it with the DS Goldeneye. It's, it's kind of deceptive. Like, it's not really a remake of well, not a, like a re-release of Goldeneye. It's sort of like a, a reimagining of it all together. Yeah, I think I see with a lot of things that nostalgia definitely clouds your judgment. There's a lot of games that I hold in really high regard, and you go back and play them, and you're like, yeah, this ain't as good as I remember it. And, uh, you know, I think nostalgia can cloud people's memories, but I don't think people are stupid. Like, I think O. Steven is right on the money here. Like, he has he's not fooled by the new Goldeneye. Like, he gets it. He's like, I've moved on from Goldeneye. Now I'm playing Modern Warfare. Or I'm playing Killzone or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm playing Gears of War or a third-person shooter with a cover system. It's kind of archaic. It was like when I went back and played Perfect Dark on mm -hmm. Xbox Live. Like, I literally played, like, the first hour or two of it, and I was like, 
I'm over this. Like the, the controls were very simple. I felt like the 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 ability to really maneuver through the environment and make sure myself is covered was was you know wasn't what I'm I'm used to. I just it felt like a dinosaur to me. Uh, you know, even though I had huge nostalgia for Perfect Dark, I was a huge fan of it back in the day it, re- it was released, but uh even though they had up up the, the visuals and up the uh, the poly count and read on the textures, it just wasn't enough for me. Like, it felt slow. It felt deliberate. There was a lot about it. It just it just seemed old. And uh, you know, I think they're gonna have to do a lot of work to Goldeneye to to keep the same thing from happening. In all honesty. Well, for me, Punch Out is a good example because I still like the original Punch Out and I still play the original Punch Out. And then the new one came out and I. I got into it and stuff, but it didn't bring the nostalgia factor for me as strong as I thought it was going to be, and I still go back and play the other one. Well, I think what I realized with that game was, wow, that game was really freaking simple. (laughs) That's one thing about it. What what about cases where games actually do justice to, you know, the, the... Their predecessors, like Metroid, like the Metroid. You know, when Metroid Prime came out, everybody was ready to. But that was a brand new game. I mean, that wasn't like a remake or a reimagining. Well, it's not a reimagining. I mean, what's? I don't know what he's really saying there. But yeah, here's the question: Like, how would something capture nostalgia? I mean, to really, I mean, basically, what I think he's really asking is like, doesn't this kind of suck? But I, I, I want to actually look at the words he's using. Like, how would something capture the nostalgia from these yeah, I mean, I, I, bygone I you, eras? Yeah. yeah, I mean, when you see Five something years like ago. Metroid <laughs> yeah. Prime or Ocarina, I mean, those definitely did a great job of capturing the nostalgia, but still making it feel like a new experience. Right. It's like, can, can this shit so hold make a, a candle sequel. to what the old games were? Uh, yeah, I think they can, but they probably don't. You know, like, it's kind of sad to me that, that the industry is so risk averse that. They keep dredging up all this old stuff as opposed to just being honest about what they're doing and making a new game without putting like an old label. Like the Castlevania, that, that could be like any any medieval dude just going around killing. It was. And at one point it was. <laughs> right. What was it they're called? Like, <laughs> well, I mean, they put yeah, a Castlevania on this. The, the go ahead. It was like a competition between teams all over the world to see who was going to make the next Castlevania game. So they didn't put the actual Castlevania name on it at first. But... Uh, yeah, that game has a lot to prove to me still. I, yeah. I really want it to be good. I want it to do all of this stuff. And can I just say, Konami's been, like, sucking balls lately on this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> those Rebirth games, they're not dreadful, but they're not really that good. I picked up Castlevania Rebirth, and I was just like, uh ah. And I was actually looking at the Russian attack game they're making. I was actually looking at that today, because I was like, oh, yeah, that's kind of like um, Shadow Complex or something. One, I'm glad Rich isn't here. Russian Attack was never a good game. Any game yeah. where you have to press up to jump is not a good game. Right, I'd agree. But yeah. 100%. Well, what I mean, are we talking about Russians in 2010? <laughs> <laughs> but I was watching the footage, and it just looks bad. The Rocket Knight game that I just put out was pretty much a travesty. It's You can ride the nostalgia train a little bit, but, I mean, don't don't overdo it. I think what does it for me more than anything is music an atmosphere. What was the atmosphere of that original game? What was the music like of that original game? I think Metroid Prime is a perfect example of that. Right. You get the whole feeling of isolation in the 3D version that you got in the 2D version. The music was there. It was redone. It sounded even better. Uh, Super Mario 64, you know, the first Mario game to go into 3D. They did a great job of recreating the atmosphere of a 2D Mario game. So to me, even more than what the character looks like on screen or or the art style that they're using. For me personally, it's the atmosphere. Can they recreate how I felt when I was sitting there when I was eight years old playing this game? And, a, and music goes a long way for me personally in, yeah, in doing right, that. Yeah. All right, and the last question I'm going to answer, and it comes from our good friend Vargan, and his question is... What is it? What is what? I've had this question before. <laughs> I think what he meant to ask is what it is. What is it? That's not a question. What it is. That's what Patrick Morales says sometimes, though. <laughs> yeah. What it is. Just, he's a Ryan, gangster. He's also into fighting games. Ryan. What? Yes. What is it? Uh, it's about this big, and it's about this color. Um, and I would say it kind of does this sort of motion. Does that make sense? And it kind of smells like that. Yeah. I think we kind of covered it. Yeah, Vargan, that's what it is. Okay. All right, that's going to do it for episode 117 as we head off to San Diego for Comic-Con 2010. 
definitely be sure to check out our coverage. By now, you've seen a good bit of it, but it will continue over the weekend. Also, as a special note, you might want to head on over to Spike.com, who will be handling all the movies, comics, stuff like that from the show. They definitely have some really good coverage going on there as well. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. Keep them coming. Uh, I don't know if, it, if we'll do another full-on... Uh, on the hook episode in in the near future but we would like to make it a regular part of the show so submit your questions at invisiblewalls.gametrailers.com again props for the great ones you guys gave us this week i think it actually inspired some of the best discussion we've had in a while so thanks guys we really appreciate it thank you for watching thank you for listening thanks for checking out our comic-con coverage invisible walls is up and out